Today on the podcast, we're up to part three of the Yippie Invasion of Disneyland. In our first part, we looked mostly at how the Yippies organized their message and why they set their sights on Disneyland. In the second part, we looked mostly at how Disneyland management and the Anaheim Police Department viewed the threat and prepared for what was called the Yippie Pow Wow. And today, we'll look at how that day began to unfold August 6, 1970, what was surely the most unusual and explosive day in the history of Disneyland, or likely that of any Disney park, with hundreds of young people converging on Disneyland during the height of the Vietnam War, leaving Disneyland managers and the Anaheim Police Department unsure how to respond also unsure if the gathering would take on tones of violence and aggression that had marked recent political protests in California, particularly a student protest in Santa Barbara that ended with the Bank of America building being burned down. A building, I should point out, that was owned by the same bank who also managed an actual bank inside of Disneyland and also sponsored It's a Small World. Our series on the Yippie protest was put together with a range of documents, including new interviews with many people who were there, both working for Disney and organizing the protest. And so, if you're ready, let's jump in. As two worldviews clash inside of the happiest place on Earth, one intent on limiting war and corporate greed, and the other on creating pleasurable fantasies that give Americans a reprieve from their work and family duties, something that might be perceived as a necessary break from the pressures of modern life. Okay, here we go. Disneyland managers arrived to work early on August 6th, the day that the Yippies were scheduled to congregate in the park. Some started while it was still dark, gathering into a training room that had been converted into a command center for the management team at Disney. Included among them were the mayor of Anaheim, Jack Dutton, and the city manager, Keith Murdoch. The room was arranged with folding chairs, each with an ashtray. The room was also used as a press center for reporters interested in covering whatever happened. Quote, I got there early in the morning, about 5.30 or 6.30, recalled Disneyland manager Ben Harris. We had at least three buses there. One was a holding area, essentially a jail. Another was a courtroom prepared for judicial hearings. The Yippies had said they were going to shut down Disneyland. They were going to force Disneyland to close down. As the first fingers of sunlight fanned across the park, illuminating Tomorrowland, then the castle, then Frontierland, police were beginning to gather in a side section of the parking lot. According to the city of Anaheim, the presence included members of the Anaheim Police Department, as well as, quote, over 200 additional police officers from the Orange, Westminster, Fullerton, and La Palma Police Departments. Jailers, cadets, and explorers would assist in booking prisoners and manning the command posts. Disneyland manager Jack Lindquist recalled that, quote, about 400 police units gathered backstage in the park. We had another staging area across the street at the Disneyland Hotel and one at the Anaheim Convention Center. El Toro provided a company of Marines, and more Marines were prepared to fly in by helicopter if necessary. But law enforcement and Disneyland managers weren't the only groups to arrive early. Also at the park was Claude Owens, who came to Disneyland, quote, for the purpose of selling the free press to people as they arrived. He stood in front of the Disney property, attempting to sell the Alt Weekly to interested parties. Later that day, he would end up being arrested. In the hour before opening, Ben Harris recalled that the police rehearsed formations. Quote, the biggest assignment was on Main Street, behind the Hills Brothers and City Hall gates. They looked like a Roman legion. 
They were on the street an hour before we were open, going through these drills quietly. If need be, they would form a group to protect any guest. In addition to the ground formations, there was one other detail also rehearsed. Quote, Up on the roofs, out of view, were marksmen, Harris recalled, all down Main Street. Also on the top of Main Street buildings was a camera operator with a 16mm camera and tripod. Wearing a wide straw hat, he stood there for most of the day, using a high-powered zoom lens to take footage of presumed yippies as they approached the park, and then, if they bought a ticket, walked to Town Square and down Main Street. The film would likely provide evidence that could be used, if necessary, in court. A second camera was positioned elsewhere above Main Street. At least one of these two camera operators would end up down on Main Street in the thick of the crowds, as the park filled with anxious guests later in the day. Officially, Disney executives were in control of the park. On the ground were Dick Nunes, head of operations, as well as Don Tatum, and, at least at times, Roy O. Disney. In consultation with the chief of Disneyland security and the Anaheim Police Department, they would make decisions about in-park security. However, if Disneyland executives decided that they needed police support inside the park, control of the Disney property would then be handed over to the Anaheim Police Department. Dick Nunes would later explain that in a private moment, when discussing the Yippie situation with the elderly Roy Disney, he had told them, don't let them shut us down. Those Disneyland employees driving to work saw clear signs that this day would be different. On his way in, Cast member Steve Silverman recalled spotting, quote, two helicopters parked on the lawn of the Anaheim police station. Two highway patrol cars were parked along the Santa Ana Freeway's harbor exit. Police checked cars turning into the employee's parking lot, which was filled to capacity. Signs of unusual activity continued as he left his car and went to work. Quote, as I entered the park through the employee's entrance, I remember seeing the riot squad of the police department waiting backstage behind the Bank of America on Main Street. They were decked out in full riot gear waiting for something to happen. Before opening, managers briefed the hourly employees as to the potential problems faced that day. Sherry Chafin, a cast member, recalled that most managers expressed feelings of annoyance, quote, that this was an invasion and that how dare them to challenge the ideals of the happiest place on earth. But Chafin also noted that some of the younger employees didn't see it as an invasion. Some saw it as a valuable protest against the Vietnam War, a war that held very little support among college students. Chafin herself understood the divide. She said, quote, I was 21. I was a war protester, but not at work. In those early hours on the streets of Anaheim, there was very little activity aside from typical guests arriving early for a day of family fun. At 7.30, police arrested four men in the parking lot on charges of trespassing, presumably as they were trying to sneak into the park before it opened. From the rooftops, a camera operator zoomed in on groups of presumed yippies as they approached the front gate. Police, lined up by ticket windows, spotted yippies in the area, but, quote, only in groups of two or four. The gates that day opened at 8 a.m., and as they did, managers took their places around the park. Dick Nunes remained near the front entrance. When he saw young people with long hair signaling perhaps a potential problem, he personally greeted them. You're welcome to come see the park, he said, then indicated that the park would not allow any disturbances. He believed that he was expressing Walt's vision for the park, that it would be a place open to all, a place filled with people from different backgrounds, but people focused on enjoying themselves, not creating a political demonstration. Footage taken by the rooftop camera person showed Nunes, dressed in a short-sleeved white shirt and thin black tie, talking to multiple groups of young people as they approached the park throughout the morning. Disneyland manager Van France explained, quote, 
My job was to walk the park dressed as a tourist and report any unusual incidents. Another manager explained that it was his assignment to, quote, sit on a bench all day watching for any signs of trouble. Some managers carried walkie-talkies, radios so large that they needed to be hidden inside of Disneyland merchandise bags. Most of the attractions were staffed with additional employees. The Matterhorn, for example, was staffed with twice its usual number with those additional cast members observing the crowd and checking the ride's perimeter for any unusual behavior or objects. Chuck Shields recalled, quote, We were all given radios and asked to report any incidents to security. Some hourlies received special duties. For example, cast member Chuck Heath was stationed beside the People Mover Tunnel. He was directed to radio in if he saw, quote, guests lighting up their joints. Though most all available employees had been called to work, Managers decided not to use those who dressed as characters, as they could become easy targets if there was a disturbance. Cast member Steve Ralston remembered, quote, We reported to work as usual, but were not sent out on set. I guess the fear was that we would be abused or disrobed from our costumes. Unlike other park employees, we were the company symbols. Hey, look, there's Mickey Mouse. By late morning, there were over a hundred yippie activists in the park, including event organizer David Sachs. Quote, when I bought my ticket, I had asked for a clerical discount since I was a member of the Universal Life Church and my license said Reverend David Sachs. Boy, did that cause a scene as I looked like the rest of our motley crew. He then followed other yippies into the park. All were made aware of the park's dress code. But some men, shortly after moving through the front gates, took off their shirts and walked bare-chested down Main Street. Some young people, unwilling to buy a ticket, simply stood at the entrance fence and talked to their friends inside, curious if anything was happening. Multiple young men were turned away as they tried to carry either a bedroll or a sleeping bag into the park. At least one young man arrived in an Old West-style bandit handkerchief mask covering the lower part of his face. Another showed up with a black vest displaying in block white letters the word Yippee across the back, perhaps so he'd be easy to spot. Quote, Early in the day, cast member Steve Simons recalled, everyone was feeling out the other side. I met two of the yippies in New Orleans Square, and they said that most of the yippies were enjoying the attractions. One of the yippies recalled that upon entering the park, he understood he was being watched. Quote, security was everywhere, mostly in plain clothes. They tried to look unobtrusive and blend in. Fat chance of that. A number of yippies carrying their own cameras took photos of the 16mm camera operator stationed above Main Street, as well as a handful of other photographers walking through the crowd. This raised the question, who was really watching who? Front gate ticket takers were directed to give new ticket booklets to anyone who complained about problems at the park. The booklets were good for a later visit. For a while, the park alternated between moments of calm and moments of tension, as management wondered if the yippies would blend into the environment, enjoying the attractions like everyone else. But this stasis would only last a little while, as the real trouble would unfold later in the afternoon. Though the day started slowly with only a few arrests, by 9.30 the trouble was building. The police got a call from a neighboring hotel that youths with long hair were throwing deck chairs into the pool. An hour or so later, the first significant incident occurred on Disney property, with a group of 40 yippies gathered at the entrance gate. Officer Bastrop would later explain, quote, They refused to disperse and either buy tickets or leave the park. One man in his mid-thirties appeared to be the spokesperson, quote, when park officials tried to reason with him, Officer Bastrop said, he became vulgar and defiant, with the group chanting slogans behind him. Some of the group started picking flowers and throwing them at park officials. 
police and park managers were able to defuse the situation without it erupting into a larger protest. Following this, Disney managers made good on their promise to include the press if the park encountered any problems. As Steve Simon recalled, quote, There was the photo op at the main gate, around 10.30 to 11. It took only five minutes. Somehow the press was told to be there at that time, and out came the riot squad to pose. They paraded in front of the ticket booths. They formed a line while the photographers snapped away. All disappeared quickly. Inside the park, the early disturbances were minor as well. At the back of the property, patrolmen combed through, quote, the bushes after someone had jumped the fence. This led to two more arrests. Multiple employees recalled that adventure through inner space, a ride in which guests explored the world of the atom, became a gathering point for the yippies. The showrooms of that ride soon held the thick odor of marijuana smoke, with guests holding lit reefers moving past stages arranged with giant snowflakes. Managers remained vigilant. More spotters were placed on top of buildings to observe activity in the park. And ride and shop supervisors kept an eye on their areas. Quote, I was working in the candle shop on Main Street that day. Sherry Chafin remembered. My supervisor asked me to check the trash cans on Main Street for bombs. Uh, no thank you, I said. A reporter from the L.A. Times noted that around noon, the Yippies, quote, gathered on the drawbridge to Sleeping Beauty's castle. When the Disneyland band made its regular circuit down Main Street, the Yippies, in full regalia of buckskin fringe, blue denim, and tie-dye shirts, followed along, chanting, Ho, Ho, Ho Chi Minh is going to win, with Ho Chi Minh representing the powers of North Vietnam. Another paper reported that the same group also sang, quote, the Mickey Mouse Club song and let loose obscene chants. Following this, a group of yippies marched over to Captain Hook's pirate ship in Fantasyland, where from the upper deck they made speeches about the war and the problems with American culture. A few of them worked their way up the rope rigging to get a view of the park. A reporter from the San Bernardino Sun observed that, quote, at one point, a youth who climbed the mast declared, People of America, we have liberated this ship. What exactly liberating a ship that was built on a cement foundation meant, no one really knew. Then, as though unsure what else to say, he added, Mickey Mouse shoots heroin. Below them, around the ship's entrance, stood a dozen cameramen, most attached to newspapers photographing the event. The moment was surreal, somewhat tense, a young person liberating a pretend pirate ship, but it was also a disturbance easily contained by park security. As the day warmed into afternoon, however, the atmosphere began to change. More men took off their shirts. Outside the park, by the ticket booths, a group of young people picked roses and threw them inside the park, littering the ground around the newsstand with a carpet of white and pink petals. Other people lay on the grass, not far from the ticket booths, and started smoking, unwilling to buy a $3.50 adult general admission ticket to the park. At some point, a decision was made to let young people, some with and some without shirts, sit on mats and sleeping bags and smoke outside the park, while at the same time, managers would patrol the area inside the park to make sure these things also didn't happen there. By midday, police spotters placed the number of yippies in the park at around 400. There were hundreds more outside the park and in the parking lot. Andrea McGann, a tour guide, recalled that, quote, After lunch, the mood subtly started to shift. Tension seemed to be mounting by the hour. Some of the security officers became increasingly agitated. Lots more discussions were going on over those headsets. One Disneyland lead recalled that there were isolated incidents with the Yippies in Adventureland and then at It's a Small World, the ride sponsored by Bank of America. Paige Gorman, who worked Storybook Land that day, saw, quote, Security personnel checking the area of the patchwork quilt in response to a rumor that something had been thrown from a Casey Jr. train. 
Many park guests growing weary of the yippies' antics voiced their complaints. One yippie explained, quote, Parents were cursing us, dirty hippies. Other guests marched up to town hall to demand a refund where they were offered a new set of tickets for a future date. A cast member remembered the yippies, quote, took quite a bit of abuse from some of the rest of the guests because of their dress and long hair. He also recalled that the abuse was often unprovoked. Quote, the mood did turn as the day went on. The impression I got was that the yippies were getting fed up with the comments from other guests and being spit on. In the early afternoon, yippies gathered into large assemblies, but according to the Los Angeles Times, they were scattered into small groups by security, only to start to gather again. Though some young people were there to have a good time and witness whatever happened, others were there to participate in a statement to somehow use the event to communicate a political message to America via the press. Field Lieutenant Bastrop's memories corroborate this observation. Quote, At first, the yippies were content to gather in small groups and yell obscenities at bewildered guests. As quickly as security officers approached them, these packs dissolved, only to regroup elsewhere. A few fights were reported, but not confirmed. Yippies also tossed lighted matches into trash bins, and firemen with hand extinguishers were dispatched to put the fires out. For most of the day, this was the largest concern, that a trash can fire would spread to shop or ride buildings, much as it had when students burned down the bank in Santa Barbara. At one point, albeit briefly, a legalized marijuana banner was hung from the front of a Main Street store. As one yippie recalled, the park wasn't entirely unified against their theatrics. Some of the hourly ride operators, quote, Thought we were cool. After all, we're a great change of pace from the families from Ohio. Employees at the Pirates of the Caribbean let us on for free. They didn't want our e-coupons. Roy Disney appears to have stayed close to Main Street for much of the day, as did other executives. Most police officers remained behind Main Street as well. This may have been related to police concerns that Bank of America near the railroad station might prove a likely target for a yippie protest or worse for violence. One employee recalled that, quote, there were three or four cast members with Roy. At one point, as one of the yippies acted in a defiant or threatening way toward Roy Disney, one of the cast members, quote, stepped in between the two, placing himself between Roy and the young man. By late afternoon, a feeling of quiet desperation began to move through the yippie contingent. Soon, the sun would be gone, limiting the group's ability to create photo-worthy theatrics. Moreover, according to that itinerary printed in the LA Free Press, there was only one last scheduled event around which to build a demonstration, the infiltration of Tom Sawyer Island. Among the yippies, there were murmurs of, Pass the word. There's going to be a smokeout on Tom Sawyer's Island. We're going to liberate Tom. To liberate Tom, however, required a D ticket, which each of the yippies needed to purchase. The movement toward the ticket booths and the docks was quickly spotted by security and other cast members. Quote, I started to follow them one cast member recalled, and almost ran into a photographer, also in full combat gear, rushing to get down to the rafts so he could get over to Tom Sawyer's Island. At that time, Tom Sawyer Island was largely constructed around popular myths of the Western expansion, settlers versus Native Americans, as spun out by Hollywood. For the more serious-minded of the group, the Yippie mission was to transform depictions of manifest destiny into a theater of classy quality, free love, and free dope.
Once on the island with a place to organize, the political ambitions of the Yippies started to congeal. One group began to turn the retreat into something that resembled an anti-Republican beach party, while another organized an anti-war political statement. One participant recalled, quote, When I got to Tom Sawyer Island, there was plenty of weed and people were smoking, standing around talking and playing frisbee. Another person remembered, quote, Somebody made a speech. We smoked a joint in Engine Joe's cave. Joe would have been proud of us. The Berkeley tribe would later report, quote, It's a killer. A dozen raffloads of freaks make it over to the island. As the group grew, traditional day guests, mostly families, began to leave the island, taking rafts back to New Orleans Square. Also on the island, at least for a little while, was Disneyland manager Van France, who was fingered almost immediately as an undercover security officer. Quote, Evidently, my disguise was not too good, he later wrote. As I strolled around Tom Sawyer Island, yippies yelled, Hark, hark, a narc! It's now unclear how long he remained before seeking the security of the rafts. With the island occupied almost wholly by yippies and yippie sympathizers, the atmosphere quickly changed from that of a controlled theme park to that of a political concert, with the participants now in charge rather than the cast members. Robert Campbell, who worked the keelboats, recalled one trip, perhaps his last for the day, where, quote, I made the turn after the burning cabin, and the guests were treated to a yippie skinny-dipping party. But not all of the yippies on the island were satisfied with how the day was progressing. Some were troubled that the event had not yet produced the meaningful political demonstration that produced a clear message in newspapers and on television. Others were upset that they had been shunned, called names, and even spit on because of their appearance and beliefs. By late afternoon, politically minded participants had organized many of the yippies inside of the fort, with a couple hundred crowded into the courtyard and with a few now seated on the wooden roof. People made speeches as joints were passed from hand to hand, though many recalled the moment the exact message of these speeches is now lost to history. But whatever the words, the speakers began to unite the group under a political umbrella, one that deplored the artificiality of Disneyland, one that despised capitalist structures in which money was exchanged for entertainment, one that resented large corporations such as Bank of America for financing the war effort in Vietnam. The high point of the island protest occurred when one member pulled down the American flag from the fort flagpole and raised what some managers and reporters, including one from the Berkeley tribe, would misread from a distance as the Viet Cong flag. It was, however, as David Sachs would later point out, quote, a black flag with green marijuana printed over a red star, as opposed to the Viet Cong flag with its gold star. The crowd erupted with breathy cheers as the fort was now symbolically under the governmental control of the Yippies. Dick Nunes explained that the Yippies, from what he understood, had not only pulled down the American flag, they had burned it. Nunes saw this as a type of provocation. Quote, sort of a harassment thing, he said. They wanted us to really make some mistakes. In other words, he believed that the flag burning was designed to escalate tensions and create a standoff between the police force, older white managers of the park, and the younger energized yippies, something that might be photographed and featured in newspapers in which the yippies without weapons looked defenseless against officers in riot gear. One reporter situated in Frontierland recalled that the Yippies were so loud on the island he could hear them across the water. Quote, they chanted, legalize marijuana, he said. By now the island was officially closed to new guests, though one cast member explained that security may have, quote, facilitated the takeover of Tom Sawyer Island to corral the group in one location far from other guests. Jack Lindquist said it was more happenstance. 
Once the Yippies brought themselves to the island, Disneyland management, seeing how this isolated their activities, shut down the rafts, essentially trapping them on the island. Quote, the Yippies could sit there all day, Jack Lindquist said. For a while, as Lieutenant Bastrop remembered, the police considered moving squads of officers via the rafts over to the island, quote, to quell the disturbance and likely arrest protesters one by one. But police were never used on the island. Reports differ as to why this plan was not engaged, as it isolated some of the most politically-minded yippies intent on creating a spectacle. This plan would have prevented other disturbances from happening later in the day. But Disneyland managers chose a different approach. Officer Bastrop recalled that park officials discussed the matter with Yippie leaders, which, quote, resulted in the group agreeing to leave the island, though not without some prompting. To move the process along, Disneyland security officers swept the Yippies toward the rafts, ensuring that they left the island, but only to mix back in with other guests. Jack Lindquist remembered these events with slightly different details. As evening approached, quote, They pleaded to be left off the island, he said, so we brought them by raft off the island. Regardless, after two or three hours on the island, the Yippies began to raft back to the main part of the park. David Sachs explains that the stay on the island, quote, was not an overtly political event. But others remember it differently. For Disneyland officials, it seemed that the attempt to minimize problems by sequestering the Yippies was backfiring. While on the island, some Yippies found the resolve and confidence of a larger group, one unified under a variety of causes. Though many Yippies were still at Disneyland for the party and group theatrics, some now wanted to stage a full political demonstration, something that would solidify their anti-war, anti-authority message for the media, with explosive photos that could be splashed across the front page of the nation's newspapers. Now that they were off the island, the best place to do this was at the end of Main Street, near the pole that held the American flag, also near the Disneyland branch of Bank of America. Quote, the people who had gotten off these first two rafts, David Sachs recalled. That's about what it was. It was the first two raft loads of people decided to march down Main Street in Disneyland singing various odes to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. There were clearly two different movements in the park. One who wanted to speak to the experimental and expansive experiences of music and drugs, and another who wanted to condemn the Vietnam War. But now they were again coalescing into a single voice that condemned the conformity and military aggression of older Americans, of a generation who simply didn't understand what young adults now wanted. Officer Bastrop explained that some of them, quote, were arrested by security for setting garbage bins on fire, destruction or defacing of property, and assault on guests. And again, this engaged the primary fear of management that these trash can fires might engulf show buildings, shops, and restaurants. But at this point, there was an energy moving through the park, one that sparked off the yippies headed toward Main Street, an energy layered with darkness, one that not only sought to make a statement, but also perhaps destroy a few things in the process. This, more or less, was what Disneyland managers had feared, that the gathering would erupt into an event whose tone was to unmake aspects of the park, or as Dick Nunes might have seen it, to challenge the worldview that Walt Disney had once helped to create. I'll be back next Sunday with the fourth part in this series. And over on Bandcamp later this week, I'll post up another section to our audio guide for Walt Disney World. We've still got a ways to go to finish up this audio guide, but when done, this will be the first full Disney World guide specifically arranged for audio. A guide organized into chapters so you can easily find the sections that most interest you. Lastly, 
We are an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. We put out a new show every week for listeners around the world to enjoy. But without subscribers, we would simply cease to exist. We do just two things. Deep dives on stories related to the history of the Disney studio and parks, and news and analysis of current events as they relate to the Disney company. If you enjoy these episodes, you can support our efforts by becoming a monthly Bandcamp subscriber. On Bandcamp, you'll find dozens and dozens of extra episodes, but the best reason to subscribe is to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can subscribe at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll also leave a link down in the show notes. Until next time, this is Todd James Pierce.